thank you for having me. Um, and uh, I just want to say at the start that uh, um, I have a warm place in my heart for Chicago. I began my career at Motorola out in Schaumburg. Um, I was here again uh, to work for Sears. And uh, my wife went to the University of Chicago. Uh, I took some classes at Kellogg. So thank you for having me back here. It's an honor for me to be here. I'll go quickly. Um, and my talk today is um, basically about technology in action at the post. You know, we can talk a lot about the theory. Uh, we computer scientists uh, sometimes get carried away with what is possible. And then there's engineering that uh, comes in and says that might be true, but that's right now impossible at scale. So what I'm talking about here today is stuff we actually have working in the post. There's one or two that's still in the lab, but it's close to production, OK? So uh, before we start on the actual products, uh, I had a boss who once told me that it's always easier to tell a success story if you have the numbers to prove it. So let's look at the numbers first. Uh, that is our growth in digital traffic uh, over the last few years. Uh, and this is domestic audience only. Uh, the numbers will come out actually on Tuesday for this month. And we are approaching 100 million uh, unique visitors a month of US only audience. So what, the US has about 300 million folks. So one in three people are coming to the post uh, to get news and information. And if you count in international, uh, that number goes to about 150 million a month. And again, this is where this third party system can measure. There are many new platforms, Snapchat for example, that is not measured by the measuring companies. So that's our growth. Um, the shift is also remarkable. Um, in about uh, late 2013, we were sitting at about 40, 60 mobile desktop. Now, we are almost 70, 30 mobile desktop. So the vast majority of our growth has come from mobile devices. Not surprising, but very interesting. Now, if, th those are the unique visitors visiting the Washington Post. But are they one-hit wonders? Do they just come, snack, and leave? Or are they actually spending time? The good news is the time spent is also up. So we have a lot more folks coming to us and spending significantly more amount of time. You put them together, and that's a pleasing graph to look at. So this is how we see ourselves. Um, you know, there's no doubt in anybody's mind that content is king. If, if, if our journalists, our investigative reporters, don't do their stuff, if we get our facts wrong, then there's no point being in this game. And I'm sure that you journalists know all about that. But, but, Google has spoiled us with its speed. You go to Google, you search for, I don't know, Northwestern. It'll tell you that it found 62 billion articles in 0.0002 seconds. That's taken for granted by consumers. Yeah. You, you take your iPhone, um, or you, or you take a, a, a Samsung um, a Galaxy 8 phone. They are beautiful products. They are beautiful products. So consumers are taking uh, products for granted in terms of their speed, in terms of their beauty. You, you shop at Amazon. The convenience is amazing. Yeah? You spend time in some of these social networks. It's addicting. The UX design uh, gets you to stay there for a long, long time. So. In today's world, while content is still king, it's equally important to get your product and technology right. And that's why the marriage of technology and journalism is so important. And those who understand that will do well with consumer delight. And those who don't, unfortunately, I think, will fall by the wayside. So you can have excellent journalism, but poor technology and products. I don't think you'll do too well. Or you can be a very strong technology company, but not understand the true uh, workings of good journalism, and you will have problems like fake news. So our intent is 
to be excellent at both. That is the intent at the Washington. Another quick thing before we get into the real products, um, you know, this is not uh, unheard of, but consumers are everywhere today. And you see a lot of uh, 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 very strong uh, journalistic uh, oriented uh, companies and brands shy away from that. Uh, they sometimes are circling the wagons and saying that you can enjoy our journalism, but only in our garden because we are not so trusting of all these other platforms that have emerged. And it's expensive to push your content in a way that's consumable in all these different platforms. At the Washington Post, we embrace where users go. And we are keen to do what it takes to have our content meet our readers where they are. So that's a little bit of a shift in our philosophy versus some of the other brands as well. And so let's get on with it. Um, today I want to talk to you about a variety of products. And if you look at your screen, um, like in any data lake architecture, there's a lot of stuff that goes in. But the stuff that comes out is sometimes hard to articulate. Uh, a lot of time is spent figuring out how best to gather the data. But the products that consume and surface that data often are uh, not fully developed. I will spend my time today talking about uh, the right-hand side of the screen, which is the products that we have developed that actually surface a lot of the data that we pull in. A note on the technology side. Um, if you came to me 10, 15 years ago and said, uh, you know, uh, you would need to build some of these products that I'm going to talk about, I would have told you that I would need a lot more money because simply uh, the middleware and the technology stacks were not there uh, for me to borrow and build upon. You would have to build from scratch and so you needed to be a Yahoo or a Google type to actually do any real stuff with big data. Now with the advent of some of these technologies, um, CIOs like me, um, in smaller uh, companies like the Washington Post can still achieve a lot by leveraging and piggy piggybacking on some of these uh, stacks that have emerged. So let's talk about our first uh, product. We call it Clavis. Uh, Clavis in Latin, for those of you who are interested, uh, means key. So it's a key that could unlock certain insights. And essentially, let's just uh, talk about it quickly. Every piece of content that flows through our CMS at the Washington Post uh, is looked at by Clavis. It could be our advertising content that we also produce, and we'll talk about that, or it could be content that the newsroom produces. And Clavis goes into that content, um, pulls out 10 grams, and looks to see how it might assign it to a relatively loose taxonomy. And I'm not talking a very broad taxonomy like politics or business or sports. I'm talking about a taxonomy that's deeper than that. Okay, so it could be green energy, it could be millennials, it could be uh, trade and commerce. And typically, Clavis assigns every piece of content typically to about seven nodes. And it puts a confidence interval. So it could say that I'm fairly sure that this is talking about green energy uh, and uh, urban renewal, I'm not so sure if it's economy or science. Uh, but it will attach it uh, in those notes, every piece of content that goes through. And then on the other side, uh, this is a little trickier to do, but you know, this is the standard user segmentation. And user segmentation, if you are a subscriber to the Washington Post, is far easier than if you are a social mobile visitor uh, who's visited us uh, just once that month. But to the extent that we can, there too, Clavis tries to assign you to segments that are relatively deep. And then the standard uh, course of action after that is you can take that, put it together, and surface it uh, for personalization. Okay. Uh, the, the results are fairly good. If you did a random uh, sample of content, that's the red line, um, 
you know, people still click on that. If you simply say, this is recommended for you, even if it's a random set, people do click on it. But if you put in a little bit of the secret sauce, the click-through rate goes significantly higher. And I'm happy to say that uh, if you try an A-B test, we tried an A-B test um, with some of the market-leading um, secret sauce generators, and our in-house solution beats that quite handily. But the more interesting case in my mind is where does this engineering uh, help you to make real money? Okay. And that comes about when we use Clavis to actually look at advertiser content. So what, what's happening in the um, marketplace right now is that there's the usual display ads that you get from an exchange like Google or Facebook audience network. But more and more advertisers are coming to us and saying, you guys know how to tell stories. Can you tell a story about my brand? So Nike comes to us, or Microsoft comes to us, or you know, some bank comes to us. And the sales side of the Washington Post has hired journalists who write in a way that tells their story, that tells the story for their brand. We call it native content or sponsored content. Um, but they do need the CMS and the tools we have built for the newsroom to tell a visually rich story. And that story also is examined by Clavis. And so Clavis looks at newsroom content, looks at the advertising content, and then puts the advertising content within the proximity of the journalistic content. So the relevance goes up. So if you are um, you know, a, 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 a health organization, Cleveland Clinic, they come to us and they want to do a certain thing about their brand. And the sales side writes a story for them. If the Washington Post has content that's also talking about Alzheimer's, or talking about cancer, or talking about other uh, such health-related concerns, then the machine can figure out that these two are close in terms of their distance and put that um, sponsored content, clearly labeled, clearly labeled, but put it within the proximity of the other content. And that typically leads to higher click-through rates, and that means the advertiser will pay more. Okay? So this is a practical example of where we are using recommendation technology to go beyond the general, you know, uh, if you like this, you might like this as well, kind of uh, scenario. Here's another example. Uh, we are owned uh, by Jeff Bezos, and Jeff is, um, uh, uh, you know, he's a very smart guy, let me just tell you that. Um, and he often uh, talks to us and says things like, you know, we need to double down on things that are working. As humans, we sometimes tend to fixate on the things that are not working and spend a lot of time and effort trying to bring those areas up and to be better. And sometimes that, sometimes that comes at the expense of not looking at what is working and doubling down on that. And he often pushes us to say, double down on what's working. And this is an example uh, where we've taken that advice to heart. So we have built something. Uh, we call it the Virality Oracle. Uh, our engineers at the Post uh, love to name things. Um, and, uh, and what it does is, what it does is, um, let's skip that for a second. That's basically the underlying technology. We can come back to that if you want to discuss it. But what it does is, it's trying to predict whether a story is going to be popular or viral. Now, first you have to define what popularity is and what virality is. Um, uh, let's put that aside for a second. But if you can predict whether a story is going to become popular or viral, what you can really do is double down on it. Right? So the newsroom you know, gets uh, messages from the virality oracle in, in a Slack room saying, hey, we think that this story is going to be red hot. Okay, we, who's we? The machine thinks that. And uh, do what you need to to double down on it. So the homepage team will see that, 
and if it's not featured on the home page, we'll push it higher up. The social team will see that and will go into uh, you know emergency mode and push it out in as many channels as possible. Our PR team will see that and send it to their contacts in the Pentagon, in the State Department, in other publications, saying that this story is probably going to be really big by the end of the day. I think you should actually take a look at it and possibly promote it. And that tends to have a doubling down effect where you know every some percentage of those folks believe that push it and the story becomes that much larger so you know why is that so hard why can't you just uh, within 30 minutes look at the click rate and say yeah this one's doing unusually well we should push it out where's the computer science in this well for those of you who fiddle around with fuzzy algorithms um, you know this, there's the precision and there's the recall, right? Uh, and those curves typically go in opposite directions. Uh, precision is what? Precision is that if you ask an algorithm to recognize some, something, you, know, you want it to recognize a face, let's say, then the precision angle is how many of the faces that it, that it thinks is Shailash is actually Shailash. In other words, what's the error rate, right? So there are 10 folks and it says, these five are photographs of Shailash, these are not. You look at those five and say, how many did it get wrong? That's precision. And if it's highly precise, then all five of them indeed will be me. Um, and if it's not precise, it would have gotten some, you know, a large percentage wrong. Recall is the other side of that, right? If there were nine pictures of me, how many did it actually say were me, the recall? And typically those go opposites, why? Because if you want high precision, the algorithm becomes very conservative. And then recall drops. So it will indeed correctly, the things that it says is me will be me, but it will miss a lot of others that are actually me. So precision goes up, recall drops. Okay? What you really want to do in this type of um, uh, predictive algorithm is to make sure that both precision and recall are optimized. So if you only use click-through, that's typically the graph on the left, right? Though, though you want those dots to be in that zone, you get many of them right, but you get many of them wrong. And if you do that, then the newsroom says, yeah, I don't know about this new technology thing, you know? It told me that this would be a hard story. It wasn't. And, and by the way, that other really hard story it never found. So I don't know if I should keep listening to this stuff that it posts on Slack. But if you take other signals into account, you know, uh, you basically take who the author is. You take the time of day that the story is getting ready, right? Of course, you look at what's happening on the social side. Um, is that hashtag trending on Twitter? Is that trending uh, in Quora? Is that trending in Facebook, etc.? You put a lot of these other signals and you fiddle with the weightage of those signals till you get to a point where the graph looks more like the right, where the precision and the recall start getting good. So <clears throat> that's uh, another piece of technology that we have working in the newsroom right now. Here's another one. Uh, we call it Bandito. Um, it's, this is based on the multi-armed uh, bandit uh, uh, strategy, where if you go to Vegas, the strategy um, to win uh, is what? Uh, you, you first experiment, you look at those slot machines and you experiment with them. And if you find that there is one or two that perhaps are more favorable, then you exploit it. And that was the, that's the whole multi-arm bandit thing. And why bandit? Because you'll probably not get a slot machine that has a flaw in today's world in Vegas, and so it's a bandit will steal your money. Um, but the algorithm is, is based on trying to figure that out. So we do that at the post, okay? Um, we encourage our newsroom uh, to do as many headlines as possible. As many headlines. As many images as possible. As many blurbs as possible. And then the machine looks at which combination is winning and gives more and more traffic to that winning combination till it converges on that. And you can splice and dice it. You can splice it that perhaps um, 
you know, the content uh, headline and image is doing better with women versus men, is doing better internationally, say in India versus the US, or Canada versus India, and since it's a machine deployed at scale, it will converge it for that segment and give more and more traffic to that. Um, search engines do that. I used to work at Bing at Microsoft. Uh, we used to spend time running these nets where you know uh, people would think that they get the same set of results when they typed a certain term into a search engine. Typically, that's not the case. You have thousands of nets running, and the system is deciding which one is the one that's getting the most traction and giving that more and more play. So that's what we have done uh, with this piece of technology um, that we've built. And uh, here are some examples. These are two variants. Um, the image is different. The headline is different. And you can see the lift in one versus the other. Here's another one. This is a significantly different lift. The image is the same. The headline is different. Now here I've got just two. You know, our goal is to have for as many stories as possible, not just two, but many, many variants. And then to splice and dice it across segments to drive engagement and traffic up. And you don't just have to measure click-through. Uh, it's, it's, it's an algorithm. It could, it, it could measure time spent. It could measure scroll depth. It could measure both scroll depth and time spent. So it's up to us how we tune it. Now, one of the issues with technology like this is, and this is what you find in the practical world, you, know, you may build uh, a lot of tools. You may exploit a lot of big data. But then there's also the adoption side of things. Right? If you're already doing a lot of work, and you give me yet another tool that would make things better, but I have to spend time with it, what is the adoption? So you can go one step further. What if the machine helped you to write those headlines? And uh, again, we can look at the technology behind it, but let's look at the application. Here's an example. Um, and you can see we have multiple algorithms that are trying this. But you know, you, I'll give you a few seconds. Look at what the human did. There's a human headline there. And then what three of our algorithms did. It's not too bad. Right? Um, I wouldn't say it's awesome, but it's not bad. And now again, think about the scale. If you can have a machine do this, and we are working on the image side as well, uh, and an image and a headline is typically a combination, then now you can take the thousand plus stories we put out on the web every day and have you know four, five, ten variants for every story and splice and dice that per segment. You know, what what do women like versus men like? What is popular, what is working well in Canada versus India versus the US? What works well in the morning versus the evening? And it, it, you don't have to have a human monitoring that result. A-B testing has been here for a long time. The problem with A-B testing is what? A human has to look at the results. You have to let a day pass, two days pass. And you say, yep, this is the winner. We'll go with this. News doesn't lend itself to that. What's important right now is gone in a day, you know, sometimes within hours. So you need the machine to help you to capture and exploit that moment at the right time, and at scale, at scale. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's another product that we have uh, built using a lot of the automation and big data in the, uh, that we have. And here's another one. Um, this is interesting because I have worked with someone who used to be here at Medill uh, to do this, and he now works for the Washington Post. We call it Heliograph, um, <coughs> and. Uh, the goal here is automated storytelling. Okay, and uh, you know I've, I've gotten beaten up on Twitter on this one. Uh, my goal isn't uh, to replace journalists, well, at least not right now. Um, <laughs> I don't think that uh, engineering has advanced that far to write an opinion piece or to write a deep analysis of, of what's going on. 
Okay, this is uh, right now uh, focused on areas where there is a lot of data. And, and Dean Ham talked about how difficult it is sometimes to get that data. Okay, uh, but there are uh, uh, areas where there's a lot of data. Olympics, to, uh, Olympics uh, results, election results, um, crime, real estate, earnings announcement. And the newsroom uh, will write about these things all the time. You know, what, what were the earnings announcement uh, that came out from Sears? You know, is it, uh, it was up 30%, down, blah, blah, blah. What's going on with the crime rate in Chicago, et cetera, et cetera. We write about these things. But we have to be very, very careful in choosing only the biggest stories to write about. The machine doesn't have to worry about that, right? So um, uh, this, this algorithm uh, takes structured data and pushes content out. Okay? And the interesting thing about uh, having lots of content is if you look at the graphs of consumption, I should have put that here, I'll do it in the next deck. If you look at our graphs of consumption, it is true that our biggest stories drive the maximum traffic. But there's also a long tail after that. You know, stories that have 100 uh, uh, page views, 200 page views, 50 page views, 3 page views. But if you integrate the area under that curve, that thing is a large <laughs> chunk as well. So it's not just that, you know, you get, you know, your 100 top stories and you're done. There is a long tail of content that also drives usage and ultimately advertising and subscriber revenue. Okay? So, uh, Heliograph is attempting to do that. And, um, you know, um, this is a little bit of the uh, technical framework, uh, but le let's look at some of the results. So, we started this first during the Olympics, and, you know, uh, the advantage of a machine doing it is pretty much you can cover every sport uh, with every country and put it out on any channel that you want. It doesn't have to be just on your site. You can put it out on Twitter. You can even uh, put it out with Alexa on the Amazon Echo. Right? And like I said, maybe the, the population at large doesn't care about the soccer game uh, between two small countries, but there might be 10, 15, 100 people that do care. Okay? And um, we did that with the elections as well, uh, not just the big states, but pretty much every precinct in the United States. And now um, we are fiddling around uh, with sports, where we, get, we, we the machine puts out stories on sports and also attaches NFL player cards in case you are interested to see what the stats are for that player. And recently, uh, we've uh, taken on this goal of putting out in the DC region, in Maryland, Virginia, and DC, the results of every high school football game that's going on out there, every one of them. And if we um, are able to see some success, early results are pretty good, we'll try to expand it into other parts of the country. Okay? So that's Heliograph. Um, and then more, um, what, 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 what else goes on? Well, it's not enough to um, do uh, a lot of products. Uh, you also need to see if the uh, measurement systems that we are using um, are something that uh, you know, is, is, is more meaningful and accurate than the standard uh, user views and page views that I showed you. That's what the industry looks at right now. How, what's your unique uh, users per month? You know, what are your page views? This is what causes advertisers to choose to work with you or not. Are you in a certain set? And we are fortunate that that's been doing very well. But I think we have to look beyond that. Right? It's not enough to just only look at, okay, what's going on with our uniques and our page views. So we are working on other metrics to look at it. Um, and here is another... Uh, example of us naming something, we call it spectrum. But essentially, it's a more aggregated view um, of how well a story is doing. And it just doesn't take into account the page views, but it takes into account other things, like time spent, like recirculation. Is it driving circulation to other content that we have? Um, we are looking at subscribers, you know, 
oftentimes you see that what non-subscribers enjoy and what subscribers enjoy are different. So is, is, should our resources be spent more on the type of content that our subscribers enjoy? I don't know if that is a black and white answer, but it is certainly something that should be taken into account. Um, and so you get a more aggregated view um, that that spectrum gives us. And what you can see, I hope you can see this at the back, but you know, in this example, uh, you can see that this story has a very high page view rank, but a lower spectrum rank. Okay. And then the next example, you can see that this has a lower page view rank and a high spectrum rank. Let's look at why. So if you look at this, you can see that, you know, in this case, you have a story that's done very well in terms of page views. But look at, for example, the recirculation. Look at the time on story. You know, those bars on top. They are not too good. Whereas when you go here, you know, you see that both the time and the recirculation are better. And you can see that the shares are significant. But look, and look at that subscriber score. So that tilts it towards a higher spectrum rank and a lower page rank. So what should the newsroom look at? If you come to the newsroom of the Washington Post, in the center where our hub is, you'll see a massive flat screen that's talking about a lot of these metrics and that drive us to make real-time decisions on what content we should be looking at, what to promote, etc. And spectrum is increasingly something that we are adopting in the newsroom as a more um, realistic metric in terms of where we should spend our time on the story. And that uh, comes together in this uh, uh, interesting way that we think about metrics. And I encourage those of you, uh, uh, you know, thinking about metrics to perhaps look at it in this fashion. And this is, again, something that um, uh, Jeff has talked to us about. Amazon also uh, works somewhat like this. And it's about lead measures versus lag measure. Okay. So lag measures are what uh, typically we as humans uh, tend to focus on. And uh, it's easier for us to understand. Lag measures are you know, things like profit, revenue, uh, page views, unique visitors. Right? These are measures that uh, are simpler to understand, easier to calculate, but are not directly in your control. Okay. You really cannot control directly your stock price, or your profit, or your revenue, or the number of uh, visitors who will come to you per month, or the page views that they will consume. These are measures we look at, but you cannot really directly control them. Uh, lag measures. And lead measures are other measures that you can directly control that, if done right, should lead to good lag measures. So let's take examples in the post, you know, um, crash rate of our apps. This is a lead measure. It's directly under my control. I should measure it, drive that to zero. Speed on your site. How fast is your site? This is in my control. I should drive that to Google speed, right? Uh, amount of content published, right? Things like uh, the number of alerts sent out. We all get these news alerts now, right? especially out of Washington, D.C. So you know, these are things, these are metrics that are really not lag measures. These are lead measures. And if you control them and get them right, then the page view should follow, the unique should follow, revenue should follow, profit should follow. And this is a. Uh, uh, philosophy that Jeff pushes um, and encourages us on, to think about things and initiatives in terms of lead measures and not worry so much on the lag measures. And this is very hard to do, by the way, very hard to do. So Luxodo is our attempt at a product dashboard that helps you to identify and measure some of these lead measures. So here's, here's uh, why it's hard. So this is um, 
Uh, when we first met with Jeff after he bought the post, one of the questions he asked us in the room was, how riveting is your content? Now, how, how, do you, how do you answer that? We in the post think it's highly riveting and great. What is a measure that tells you that? And is this something that if you control and get it right, then the page views and uniques will come? Okay. So we built this system um, where now uh, we have a bunch of crawlers that go and crawl all our, uh, not all, but most of our competitive set. Crawls the New York Times, crawls um, uh, Business Insider, the Wall Street Journal, Huffington Post, etc., etc. Brings it all, the, the headline, the image, and the blurb, brings it in-house. Sometimes if there is no image, it will go into the article, take out the first photograph, put that as the image. Um, if it doesn't have a blurb, it will pull out the first paragraph as a blurb. And then in a double blind test, every month, about 500 users, randomly picked, are asked this question. You know, would you read this? That's all. And they say yes or no. And we do that, and then you splice and dice that data to look at how good is our content compared to our competitive set. You know, how do we do with the political content with respect to the New York Times? How good is our business content with respect to the Wall Street Journal? Uh, how do we do in our content in general with respect to the Huffington Post? And then you splice and dice that data, and the newsroom looks at that. Okay. Now, in every metric, there's the development of the algorithm and the metric. And then, like I've been mentioning, there's the adoption and the use of that metric. Okay. What exactly you can do with it is still a work in progress. But this is more directly actionable than simply comparing the uniques at the end of the month with Huffington Post or the page views with the New York Times. I mean, that's much less actionable than looking at this. Okay? You can answer questions like, after the President's State of the Union, you know, whose content was more riveting? Was it the New York Times or was it the Washington Post? Another example, uh, we call it uh, breakfast, break fast, actually. And this is, um, you know, in these days of news alerts, especially in Washington, D.C., uh, you know, my boss used to be the chief of staff uh, to Ronald Reagan. He's the CEO of the Washington Post. And, and he, when he came on board, he, he, he told us that, listen, there are no silver medals in alerts. If you are in a high-powered meeting uh, in Washington and you get the news alert that gives you what's currently happening, you know, this exact time something's happened in North Korea, you own that meeting because you have that information. Okay? And so what are we doing to make sure that we are number one in alerts? Again, this is a lead measure. Wow. Are we fast enough? And when you really begin to think about it, we came up with three things to measure alerts. One is speed. Of course, speed is very important. Are we better than CNN? Are we better uh, than uh, New York Times in getting our alert out fast? But see, like in everything in life, if you look at things with, in, only in one dimension, then you often get it wrong. So you can be fast and first if you send only one alert a year, isn't it? You focus on that alert, make sure you're first. But that's not good enough. You need to have very fast alerts, but you also need to have coverage. So how do you measure coverage? So coverage, what do we do? We say that if, every, uh, if there are at least two of our competitive set that sent an alert on a particular thing, but we didn't, then our coverage gets a ding. Right? Why didn't we send it when they thought it important enough to send, to get a day? Now you can go the other way and send an alert for everything, every small thing. And if you do enough spam, you might win that game too on the speed side. So you, we do the reverse for spam. If we are the only ones that send that alert, and nobody else, even after three hours, four hours, has sent an alert, 
we consider it spammy. So you put those three things together, your speed, your coverage, and your spam, and you get a metric. Okay, now, if you're an engineer, you know, how do you measure these alerts? Well, I mean, as a human, you see two alerts and you say it's about the same thing. For a machine, it's trickier because the words might be different. Okay, some alerts come within four hours of each other, so you can't just put time as a metric. There are email alerts, there are uh, app alerts, okay? And if you really want to get into the Android iOS thing, you can't really go into the uh, system where there's a clean API for you to look at those alerts. You have to fiddle quite a bit in both Android and iOS to get hold of those things, okay? So we've spent time uh, figuring that part out, and we've built breakfast, which basically every morning uh, a report comes out. There's a real-time dashboard too, but people tend to do better with reports, where we list out every alert that we sent out, our competitors sent out, both in email and on the app, and it's ranked by respect to speed, coverage, and spam. And again, this is a lead measure. It's an actionable thing. And we've done that. We've seen significant, oh, I should mention that. In all these lead measures, there are varying degrees of action, actionability and um, you know, um, benefits that we've gotten. Breakfast has been one of the most significant. And so um, I mentioned to you, if you come to the post, you'll see this big Luxodo dashboard we've built. You can splice and dice it. Um, and, and, and you know, some of the things I'll just point out. You, you see, see those uh, blue dots on the side. So this basically uh, is, I, I hope it's a relatively recent one. Yeah, it's relative, there's President Trump proposing an IQ test face off with Tillerson. So this is <laughs> relatively new. And uh, what you see here is uh, here are our top stories for that instant in time ranked by concurrent users. Okay, so the more people are sitting on that story at that time, the higher up it is. It's basically chart beat type of scenario. And then on the right hand side is, are those dots. And those dots, if it's filled, means there's a variant for that story that's running through that bandito thing that I talked about. So our goal is what? That you should be able to scroll through these stories, you know, unlimited uh, uh, fashion, and every one of them should show all four blue dots filled in. That means we are maximizing the number of variants running for our stories to make sure that we are exploiting as much of the traffic as possible. And you can see other metrics that I talked about, you know, that bandito thing is a lead measure, the speed is a lead measure, and you know, I challenge you to look in newsrooms and see if they are actually focused on the site speed. Uh, as important as it is, oftentimes it's taken for granted. Okay, let me talk about one last uh, uh, example, and there are many more, but let's talk about one, I think this is the last example. Um, so, you know, if you go to any um, uh, news site, try the New York Times, try the Post, you know, um, people comment on stuff. There's a lot of activity on the commenting side. And in many cases, uh, that is a social interaction. So, uh, sometimes we think of social as Facebook and Twitter and forget about There's a lot of social stuff going on in our own properties, too, by way of comment. But when you read those comments, they're terrible, you know? Mm -hmm. You are an idiot. No, 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 you are an idiot. No, here comes a man. So how can you filter out that noise from the real commentary that's taking place? You know, what if you were somebody who was mentioned in the story, you know, and you put in a comment? I think your comment is so much more relevant than some random fells, random troll bashing others, right? So we spend money and time of filtering through that stuff. Humans looking through to say that this one's not allowed, this one's allowed. So Modbot um, is something that we build in conjunction with the New York Times and with Mozilla 
with a grant from the Knight Foundation um, to algorithmically look at quality of comment. Okay. And um, uh, for the engineering folks, if you want, I can talk about the details of the architecture, perhaps uh, in a Q&A or later. But uh, let's look at, uh, you know, what's going on there. So, again, in this fuzzy algorithmic stuff, um, there is the top and there's the bottom. The obviously bad ones, the machine does a good job of finding. Okay? And the obviously good ones, the machine does a good job of finding. You've got to fiddle with the algorithm so that it starts not just doing the top and the bottom, but cuts out enough such that we can actually make a material financial gain in the quality, of course, but also in the amount of uh, humans we need to just do this kind of stuff. Okay. So uh, here are some results. Uh, you can uh, look at the various um, algorithms we are using. Uh, and the accuracy, once it starts approaching 0.8, is typically for a, for a fuzzy algorithm very, very good. Okay. And then I was just talking about uh, you know, how to get to the point where you are not just lopping off the op op absolute top and approving just the absolute bottom. This is the state of the art we are in right now, where you can see that at the top we are not as good as we should be. But at the approving side, we've gotten pretty good, right? And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if you look at uh, some stuff here, you, 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 you can start looking at, <laughs> yeah, some of this is uh, hard to read. <laughs> anyway, you get the point. Okay, and then, um, Again, in here, here's another example of how you know, the machine behaves when you have certain types of content. I, I, there was no need for me to put that. <laughs> anyway, and that's it. Um, some examples of what uh, we are doing with technology at the Washington Post. I would just like to uh, leave you, before we get into Q&A, uh, with that thought that I began with. Okay. The Washington Post is a, is a place um, that fully understands and embraces that it's not enough just to be excellent in journalism. Uh, we've got 63 Pulitzer Prizes. Uh, we've got the best journalists in the world. We are very, very proud of that. But we also are fundamentally invested in making sure that our product and technology is equal to none. And that gap is there in the world today. You've got excellent journalistic companies that have ignored product and technology, or product and technology is a secondary type of support function. Okay. And you've got the fantastic technology companies that have ignored journalism, or it's a secondary type of function for them. I don't think there exists right now uh, any place that is completely invested in both. And with uh, Jeff Bezos uh, owning us, um, we believe we have a shot at that. And this is some examples of what we are doing. There is many, many other things that are going on at the post. So with that, uh, we can do Q&A. Brad Stillman from Bloomberg News. I'm curious if you, as you have introduced these tools into the newsroom, what kind of reaction have the reporters and editors given, and what challenges you have had to get them to use and, and, and just use Yeah, this? it varies. It varies. Some of them have been, um, um, and I didn't talk, just one more thing. I didn't talk about the basic CMS at all, which we have also been. Things like newsroom planning, video publishing, the uh, editor that you use to write stories, you know, uh, uh, how do you do blogging, etc. So the things I focused on here are more, uh, you know, a little bit of the uh, harder algorithmic stuff. I shouldn't say harder, uh, but fuzzier kind of stuff, the big data automation side. 
So if you look at the other set of tools, the more basic tools that you use to do your daily job, which also, by the way, is in very poor shape in the publishing industry, okay? Uh, the type of solutions you have out there, just if I could take a little bit of a tangent and I'll get to your answer, is there are really two types of base publishing systems that are out there. There are those that were built for print, okay, and as digital came on, digital got bolted on top of it. All right, so here's your print system that you've been using for, you know, 25 years. Oh, here, here comes video, let's bolt a video component. Here comes mobile, let's build a mobile component, etc., etc. And, you know, any architect will tell you that's a terrible idea because what you typically have is massive constraints in the infrastructure that then translate into, you know, lukewarm capabilities in those other things, okay? So that's one type of system. And many, many newsrooms have that because of their fear of disrupting if you split the systems out, okay? And then there are other uh, systems that have come about, you know, which say that don't, 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 don't change your underlying stuff. Why don't you buy my product because it's an excellent product for video built by ex-Google engineers, you know? And, and here's a product you should use for your blogs, and here's a product that you should use for recommendation engines, and blah, 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 blah. And then you end up with the engineer's nightmare. Those are all black boxes. There's another black box at the bottom, and the IT staff is somehow supposed to make those systems work together. It, it doesn't work. It's hacked up. People get frustrated. There aren't any open APIs and so on. And they might claim it, but there are none. So, you know, we have from the ground up built our own platform over the, over the last six years. And in fact, we are now offering it uh, as, as a product in the marketplace. It's called ARC. So the Chicago Tribune has bought that, the LA Times has, it's become a different business in the Washington Post. It's called ARC, arcpublishing.com. So if your question is around the adoption of tools that are on the underlying side of things, how to do video, how to do, uh, you know, mobile, etc., how to curate the home page, how to, uh, you know, uh, fiddle around with images, the adoption has been very, very strong, okay, because there's been a huge frustration with that. Once you get to the other type of stuff, heliogram, you know, some of the lead measure type of thing, bandito, where you need to put effort, it depends. There are desks that uh, adopted 100%. There are other desks who may not be so keen to adopt it. And that is another metric and challenge that we continue to work on, to have, um, you know, uh, best practices from one desk and the good stories that they have seen with the usage of these tools spread to others so that there is an adoption that is faster. Some things like breakfast, for example, the alerting thing has been adopted very well. We were sitting fairly low down on the food chain. Now people take it very seriously if we come out number two. You know, there's a little bit of competition going on. Other things, heliograph run by uh, Jeremy Gilbert, who sits in the newsroom, and you know, I was talking to Dean Otini about this. I mean, the breed that we need in many of our companies is a hybrid, who's, 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 who's a journalist and a technologist at heart. So Jeremy is one of those people. Uh, he's the one who, who was the father of Heliograph. He worked with the sports desk to do the Olympics, and then he worked to put it in news and to tell that story that this is not to replace journalism in a much more, you know, acceptable way. Uh, so that's seeing decent adoption. But you often need a champion and, you know, it's not, it's, the point I'll leave you with is that it's not okay for an engineer like me to say, I don't know why you're not using it. This is really good for you. It doesn't work. So, yes. Excuse me. Hi, I'm Maggie Mulville from Boston University, um, and I teach data journalism. And just to follow up on that question, is there anything that newsrooms can learn about which desks were more resistant to embrace change? Can you be more specific about which? I don't, I don't know if there's a pattern um, where certain desks might like it, certain desks might not. Um, I think it depends on the leadership of those uh, different units. 
not that, okay, it's always the style folks who are late and the foreign desk is always ahead. I have not seen any pattern like that. It, I think it depends a lot on the personalities that run uh, those. And also uh, on engineering's part, who are the engineers we've assigned to those folks? Um, you know, we have a newsroom which is integrated. So I have software developers, product designers, product managers, almost 80 of them. They don't sit on the engineering floor. They are there in the newsroom. And you know, some of them are easier to deal with than others. <laughs> so I think it's a personality thing rather than a desk. Yes? Here, Uh, hi, um, <clears throat> Elena Angelova, uh, professor of computer science. Um, so first of all, thank you for an excellent and very honest talk about what's actually possible with technology nowadays. Um, my question is about optimizing for virality and uh, excellence in journalism. Do you think those two are at odds sometimes? That's a good question. I don't know. I think the jury is still out on that one. Um, I mean, if you look, if you looked at that screen of ours where the top stories are listed, it's a mix of real hard-hitting, deep stuff and more, you know, uh, fluffy stuff. Um, the 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 absolute truth of the matter is that if we do take the subscribers' viewpoint into account, those subscribers that we have, and we charge 15 bucks a month. There are two products that we have, $14.99 a month or $9.99 a month. So it's not like cheap a dollar a year kind of thing. So if you take the subscribers' uh, viewing habits into account as a metric, people don't subscribe for commodity news. They will consume it, but they won't subscribe for that because that stuff is available everywhere. Sometime back we had this uh, story about this strange creature that had washed up. I don't know if you all saw it. Um, and nobody knew what it was. The picture was kind of weird. It was a very high-performing story for us, okay? But it was everywhere. Everyone had that picture. It, you know, it was spreading around in social. So in that case, is that a viral story? Yes, it's a viral story. Should be promoted? Yes. Will it lead to any subscribers? We looked at that, and the answer is close to zero. You know, whereas when we break a story on the Russia investigation or something that is truly original, the page views are not viral on that. Well, some of them are, but not always. But the subscribers who actually hit the paywall on that story and then pay for it is very, very high. So it's a balance, and I think metrics like spectrum, are, that's why it's so important that we don't get carried away in one direction or the other. Uh, hello, uh, thank, thank you very much, much for the presentation. Uh, my name is Adrián Segovia. I am from Univision. Um, I was working in Spain 10 years in the El País, uh, the newspaper. Um, thank you very much. I, I appreciate all the presentation. Um, I have a quick question about the goals. Uh, about the goals? The goals, yes. exactly. Yes. Editorial goals. Because, uh, as you know, we have the, the business necessities and also, obviously, uh, we need to show with the different editors about the goals that the company need to reach, but also is the balance between the journalists and the goals. Um, I see that, I obviously that I understand that you have goals, but why this goal is not showing in Luxor? Because I see that the metrics that you have there, the editors, the question is, the editors knows the goal daily or is only one thing? How is the process to communicate the goals with the editorial team? Yeah. So the view that you saw of Loxodo is just one view. Depending on who you are, you can have different modules in there. So for example, there is another module that looks at the revenue uh, that we are getting from the number of subscribers, what type of subscribers are. And that's not public information. So you need a certain privilege level to have that module in Loxodo. So that's just one view, OK? With respect to views in uh, goals in the newsroom, look, I mean, I'm not the authority on that. Marty Barron runs the newsroom. But there are some, some products we have built for the newsroom with respect to goals. One of the products that is part of the ARC platform is a planning tool. You know, who's working on what, 
when will the journalist have this story ready? You know, because in many modern newsrooms, this is done by email. You know, who's working? Blah blah blah. Back and forth, you would get lost in the chain. Video group doesn't know what the uh, other stories are coming about. Those stories don't know what video is working on, etc., etc. So we have a tool called WebScan, which every journalist uh, is using now to go in and to say certain things about their story. This is my slug. This is when I think it will be ready. And any editor can go in and see how far along they are. OK. Now, some goals are there. Marty and the newsroom have set a curve for the amount of content that they want. Not the amount, but the percentage of content they want by when. Because if you just look at print deadlines, things got ready about 5, 5.30, 6 PM because the print newspaper deadline was coming. But things have changed. We want our content to be there on the site when the audience comes. The Washington Post owns this URL, americasfirstread.com. So therefore, we can have content showing up at 6 PM. So he has set some of these percentage goals. And there is a view in that tool, um, which I don't have with me, but if you're interested, I'll send you a copy, which shows what the goal curve is and what the actual curve is with respect to how the content is moving along. And there's a very nice feature. We call it the Marty bot, which is, uh, which is if you said, you the journalist said, I'll be ready at 2, okay, at 2 PM, let's say. And your story hasn't even hit the copy editor, and it's like 1.30, the Marty bot will ping you. Say, hey, what are you doing? And it has a face of Marty. <laughs> and and uh, Marty has told me that uh, that's one of his favorite tools, because then he doesn't have to go and say, hey, automation has taken care of it. <laughs> Hi, um, Nick Diakopoulos, Northwestern. Um, so uh, thanks very much for your talks. Fantastic to learn about all the amazing uh, products that you're building there. Um, it does seem clear that, that you're thinking quite deeply about optimizing a range of different measures, um, not just click-throughs, but also sort of other quality measures as well, which is, which is great. Um, but I'm also sort of curious to kind of hear you speak about um, what other types of metrics we uh, should be looking to optimize in journalism. Um, you know, are there things beyond uh, sort of the business-oriented metrics that you seem to be optimizing for that might reflect more newsroom values, like optimizing for public informativeness or uh, community uh, formation, these kinds of things? Um, you know, there's a, there's a tendency in engineering to optimize uh, for the things that we can measure and the things and the data that's available. What other things? Should we be looking to measure so that we can really start optimizing for journalism and not necessarily just optimizing for the business of a news organization? Well, that's a very good question, and, and we grapple with that. OK, we grapple with that. I mean, my, my take on that with respect to you know, measures that uh, could actually be looked at in that respect uh, is, is much more, uh, uh, you know, the answer, at least I have, and you should talk to our newsroom senior people, is it's more about the culture. Uh, Jeff talks to us quite a bit about, you know, um, some meeting or the other, about, you know, uh, why, why would he not have started a new media company? Well, why the Washington Post? And his answer there is that because the Washington Post has something unique, you know, we want to. Uh, become more digitally focused, we want to become nationally, internationally focused, but we cannot forget our roots and what makes us the Washington Post. And so for those metrics that you talk about, I think it's much more about making sure that our culture remains true to our brand and our roots, rather than actually putting stuff on paper that you can measure. Because if it's not measurable, uh, it's, it's hard to define. It's, it's more in the culture around you that makes or breaks that. Um, and so, I mean, I, can, can I come up with a specific example? We've talked about quite a few at the exec level, but you know, 
my focus tends to be on stuff that I can put in front of you that you can measure, and then haranguing you as to why you're not up to it. So, but, but, but yeah, I mean, your point is well taken. I do think that's in the uh, culture and the DNA of the company. Which people like Marty are so good at making sure that we don't veer off, become clickbait, or you know, just for the sake of beating a deadline, put out an, a story that he has not looked at. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, somebody. Yes, sir. You have yes. Um, my, my question actually sort of follows up directly to what he asked. Because I was interested with breakfast. I mean, you have all these measures, but there's nothing in terms of a follow-up in terms of accuracy. Here you rush to get this alert out, but there is no measure to say, did we rush it out? Was it was it right? Or are we? You have a spam measure, but but there's nothing in terms of accuracy or did our measures get it right or did we rush out? Yeah, accuracy is hard to measure. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the biggest volume of complaints that we get uh, is, you know, about the fact that we are unfair on somebody. Uh, um, so, you know, how much of that is truly because of the brand of the post versus the fact that we got it right is very hard to measure. Um, and again, I go back to the culture, okay? Um, we were doing these alerts already, but let me give you some example. The system had something in place that said that, you know, people click through to the alert, right? So until that story was published, then you don't send the alert. And you had to put in the URL of the story in the tool to send it, and that tool checked if that page was there. You could put a bogus URL, you know? Um, so one of the simple things we fixed is, once you write the alert, as long, even if you don't put a blurb, that small alert becomes a web page, so that if you click through, you'll at least get that with a breaking news bar. A simple change. So it's not really fiddling around with what you would have sent out, it's just making your job easier. But why did that come up? Once we started measuring that we were not very high up in the chain, then you tell me, yeah, but the two line, you know, you're, what do you mean, I have to write a whole story before I send it? No, I'll auto-publish that. That, that. that makes it different. So, you know, there are tactical things like that, but I mean, I don't know the answer to your question about, you know, how, how would you actually make sure that in the hurry to do these things, can you put metrics in place that sort of help you get satisfaction that you are not doing stupid stuff? This is a cultural thing. Well, journalism, source checking. Yes. Yes. Is that a way to make sure that? Oh, yes. So, so, I mean, the journalistic principles of the Washington Post, and I'm the wrong guy to talk to you in detail about that, but they have not been compromised at all. And Jeff would be very upset if we compromised that. There is absolutely, I should say this, um, Jeff deals with the Washington Post at a very high strategic level, okay? He talks to us about lead measures, he talks to us about products, he's the biggest data tester when we do something, he asks me, why did you choose this design versus that? Show me the designs that you left on the floor before you arrived at this. He's very, very, he's a very strong product guy. And of course, he knows the technology like the back of his hand. But in terms of the running of the newsroom, I mean, Marty Barron runs the newsroom. He doesn't say that you should change this principle or that principle or cover this or cover that. There is nothing of that sort. Yeah. How much time do I have done? Hi, uh, Nai Wilkinson from the University of Mississippi. How much time? Okay, yes, yes, sir. So uh, I was wondering, um, what are the collaboration uh, efforts you have with universities or if there is an opportunity for academia to collaborate with Washington Post or building very nice school projects? Yeah, so we do. Um, uh, two quick points. You know this ARC system that I'm talking about, which is our CMS that we are licensing to other um, um, uh, media companies. We first did that by making it available for free to universities. So Columbia's Diamondback uh, took it. Uh, well, Columbia took it. The University of Maryland took it. Uh, 
he landed at the University of Southern California. Um, now, of course, I had a vested interest. I gave it to you for free so that I could see whether I actually could run a multi-hosted system in the cloud. Uh, so it was a mutual thing. But that was one thing where we were supplying the CMS for free uh, so that student newspapers got the best tools possible. Um, but other than that, we collaborated with Virginia Tech. Uh, some, some of these things that uh, our data science team has built uh, is in co close collaboration with Virginia Tech, who has a very strong computer science department. And uh, we've also opened, so we used to have an intern program that had two or three. And the internship was mostly about, you know, the traditional kind. You get a project, after whatever, two, three months, you do a PowerPoint, and then you're gone. Uh, we've expanded that. This year, last year, we had about 32, th we had 32 interns, and they are coding. Uh, my criteria for them is this is the real world. You don't come and do PowerPoints. You get in there and start coding. And then you will see whether you like it or not, and we will see whether we like you or not. And the metric there is how many of them return, uh, or at least one to return, then how many we hire. So we've seen some progress there. But we are open. We are open to collaborate. And hiring. I have many, many headcount. So I was telling a team of training, please give me your computer science students. I will welcome you <laughs> to the Washington Post. Uh, Carlos Talin from the University of Helsinki, Finland. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, conversion rates. I mean, going from free readers to subscribers. Uh, you didn't talk about that now, but can you say something about yes. how you manage that? I mean, yes. uh, we, have, we, have, we have now crossed, we are well north of a million paying subscribers. Um, and I don't mean, there are many ways to count subscribers, okay? Uh, we have been very conservative in how we count them. These are a million plus paying digital subscribers. So we are not taking those who actually take the newspaper and have then linked to a digital account and counting them as digital. These are pure digital pay. We have not taken the promotions that we do where you might be like, you know, six months free. We only count once you start paying. So we are north of a million. Ah, you want that. <laughs> so um, this is close to my heart because, again, this is a metric question. OK. So the easiest way, like I was talking about, to see what makes people pay, the easy way is to see on what story you hit the paywall and actually pay. OK? If you just take that, that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to give attribution to content that you read prior to subscribing and after you subscribe, OK? And then look to see if there's a pattern. Now, how do I know what stories you read prior? Because you hadn't logged in, right? You were just paying. We will back do that. So you have a cookie where I put in to say, oh, it's so and so. Once you subscribe, I attach that UID to you and then go back in time to see what are the things that you read that potentially. Now, we are still debating how much to give the stories you read prior to the story that you hit where you paid to the stories that you continue to read. This is a, there is no science in that. This is guesswork. If you take the opinion that, um, you know, the, the act of making you subscribe is harder than the act to retain you, then perhaps we should give more attribution to the prior. If you take the opinion they are kind of equal, okay, then that's another way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to give more weightage to the one you actually subscribed and, let, and equal to everybody else. And we are fiddling with this stuff. But for the post, our opinion stories are very strong on the subscription side. The politics story, the original investigative journalism are very, very strong drivers of subs. Not that the other stuff that we have is not lending to it, but those are the ones that pop out the most if you look at what story were they when they gave me the money. I think we've got time for one more question. Okay. Uh, we've already, already been selected, so. 
Thanks. Thanks. Hush and Nika Gupta. And is it like this is journalism and engineering is up there? <laughs> I mean, you all should be mixing. No, I'm definitely not an engineer. Okay. I started as a journalist. <laughs> But um, I had a question for you about the push alert strategy as well, um, which is you mentioned this idea of spam, you know, do we send something nobody else sends? But I found some pretty, you know, funky alerts from the Washington Post app. Um, and uh, I just, I remember the other day I was at a brunch and a friend and I started talking about how we both got this alert about a DNA story. It was a Saturday or Sunday morning yes. out of the Post app. Yeah. For the weekend, yes. Yeah. And so I was wondering kind of whether you're dealing with a different strategy around alerts on the weekends or the app, because uh, obviously no one else had that story. Yes. And I'm glad you, first of all, funky is in the eyes of the beholders. <laughs> it was but, a great but, story. Everyone should read it. But yeah. we have been looking at what stories might work better on the weekend rather than during the day, what things might work better in the morning than was in the evening. And on the weekend, yes, uh, that strategy is throwing a wrench into breakfast right now. Because we have shifted. If there's a breaking news, we'll tell you, weekend or not. But you know, there was, some, there was some debate on, since there wasn't perhaps anything as uh, rushing on the weekend, we were not sending much. You know? But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't send you something a little bit interesting that you might want to read, if not then, in the afternoon or something of that sort. Uh, but yeah, that's throwing a little bit of a wrench into breakfast because nobody else is sending. So, thank you, Shailesh. Okay. Thank you for joining us. A quick uh, logistical announcement, we're 15 minutes behind schedule already. We will stay that way through the lunch break. So we have a half an hour for a coffee break out front. Um, the panel that will follow is kind of our keynote fake news uh, misinformation panel. Uh, the panelists, uh, if you would make sure to come back here 10 minutes or so before uh, you start, which will be a little like five, af uh, yeah, five after, uh, that would be good to get you mic'd up for the next session. Meantime, uh, enjoy mingling outside and get yourself something to, to drink and eat.